Good morning. Good morning. Very warm welcome to the service today. It's again a happy chance for me to be with you and to lead the service this morning. The psalmist says it is good to give thanks to God, to sing songs to his name, to declare his love in the morning, his faithfulness every night. We worship God with the first hymn, The Lord is King, lift up your voice. <clears throat> heartfelt longing is to bring us the peace that passes all understanding and is of far more worth than human reasoning. In this faith we gather here in the quiet of the morning to be still and know that you are God. And in the knowing we would be open to the power of your spirit to make us brave and strong when we might be fearful and weak. To make us hopeful and confident when we might be inclined to lose heart. To make us upbeat and cheerful when we might be despairing and despondent. To make us open and inclusive when we are turned in on ourselves. To make us alert and imaginative when we are dull and safe. So may we yet become the people you mean us to be, able to bear witness to the gospel's truth for your love's sake. And we ask you now to hear us as we say the prayer Jesus taught his friends to say together. Our Father, who art in heaven, 
hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever. Amen. The first scripture reading this morning is from the Old Testament, from the book of Hosea, reading of chapter 1, from verse 2. When the Lord began to speak through Hosea, the Lord said to him, Go, marry a promiscuous woman, and have children with her. For, like an adulterous wife, this land is guilty of unfaithfulness to the Lord. So he married Gomer, daughter of Dibblein, and she conceived and bore him a son. Then the Lord said to Hosea, Call him Jezreel, because I will soon punish the house of Jehu for the massacre at Jezreel and I will put an end to the kingdom of Israel. In that day I will break Israel's bow in the valley of Jezreel. Gomer conceived again and gave birth to a daughter. Then the Lord said to Hosea, Call her Lo Ruhama, which means not love, for I will no longer show love to Israel, but I should at all forgive them. Yet I will show love to Judah, and I will save them, not by bow, sword, or battle, or by horses and horsemen, but I, the Lord their God, will save them. After she had weaned Lohruhama, Lo Gomer had another son. Then the Lord said, Call him Lo Ami, which means not my people, for you are not my people, and I am not your God. Yet the Israelites will be like the sand on the seashore which cannot be measured or counted. In the place where it was said to them, you are not my people, they will be called children of the living God. And the New Testament reading is from the Gospel according to Luke, chapter 11, reading from verse 1. One day Jesus was praying in a certain place. When he finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray just as John taught his disciples. He said to them, when you pray, say, Father, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come. Give us each day our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, for we also forgive everyone who sins against us, and lead us not into temptation. Then Jesus said to them, Suppose you have a friend, and you go to him at midnight and say, Friend, lend me three loaves of bread. A friend of mine on a journey has come to me, and I have no food to offer him. And suppose the one inside answers, Don't bother me. The door is already locked, and my children and I are in bed. I can't get up and give you anything. I tell you, even though he will not get up and give you the bread because of friendship, Yet, because of your shameless audacity, he will surely get up and give you as much as you need. So I say to you, ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks, receives. The one who seeks, finds. And to the one who knocks, the door will be opened. Which of you fathers, if your son asks for a fish, will give him a snake instead? Or if he asks for an egg, will give him a scorpion? If you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? Amen. For your gift of God the Spirit is him six hundred and three. <coughs>
words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O God, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. In his biography of Desmond Tutu, John Allen gives us a an insight into Tutu's daily routine when he was Archbishop of Cape Town. He got up at 4.30 in the morning, and this was a time for him for personal prayer. After that, he went for a 30-minute power walk and had a shower, and was then in his study at 6 o'clock for meditative reading and study. At 7.30, he met his staff in the chapel, and they had prayers and then communion at 8 o'clock. At 8.30, he had his breakfast, and at 9 o'clock, he was ready to start the working day. He worked through the morning till 1 o'clock, and then he was back in the chapel for more personal prayer. He then had his lunch and maybe an hour long nap and he started his afternoon business at three o'clock when he fulfilled all the commitments and assignments that he had to do. At six o'clock he was back in the chapel to meet his staff and they prayed together over the day's work. At 6.30 he went up the stairs to have a drink before dinner with his wife. His favourite tipple was Bacardi and Coke. And then they had their evening meal, after which he watched a little television and was in his bed just after 9 o'clock. He had exhausted reading it. Never mind thinking about how anybody could carry out such a disciplined process of daily living. John Allen comments on this daily routine. He says that Tutu's staff became aware that the ebullient extravagant and the meditative priests were two sides of the same coin. They belonged together. And that the man who could express such joyful, compassionate concern for people was only able to do that because of the disciplined life of prayer that he led. Well, you may say to me, Tutu was a one-off was. Or you may say Tutu was an archbishop and praying was his business, and it was. But it surely illustrates that if we want to take faith seriously, finding time, some time to let God speak to us and to see what he would give us is important for people of faith. This will surprise then that the disciples come to Jesus one day in Luke's Gospel and ask him to teach them to pray. Prayer is a big feature of Luke's story. Jesus himself had private prayer regularly in his Gospel. And now his followers come and say, teach us to pray. And Jesus teaches them the words of what we call the Lord's Prayer. And we'll look at that this morning. Jesus suggests that we should call God Father. And that illustrates, I think, that our best analogy to describe God's care and concern for his people is that of a loving parent for her child. But it's more than that. Because the first time we hear about God as Father is in the book of Exodus, when Moses goes to Pharaoh and speaks for God. 
He says, let my people go so that they might come and serve me. And he refers to Israel as his son. God is the father of his people. And that suggests to us that when we use the word father, it is saying something about God's concern and God's commitment to set us free from all the things that detract from our humanness and our ability to be the kind of people he wants us to be. After inviting us to call God Father, he says, remember, God is different from us. Hallowed be your name, holy. And holy simply means different or other than we are. One of the great temptations for people of faith is to imagine that we can control God or manipulate God or bribe God even by our Sunday services or our regular worship. But that is not so because God is other than we are. Isaiah captures it perfectly when he says, My thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are your ways my ways. I am other than you are. And that is immensely important for us to remember because it prevents us from thinking that we can control or manipulate or bring God. But even though God may be a mystery that we cannot unfold entirely, we do believe that we know the central characteristics of God through Jesus. Our Father, hallowed be your name. And then before we ask anything for ourselves, we say, your kingdom come. Every Sunday we pray that God's rule will eventually, in the end, prevail on earth. And by saying that, we are committed to helping it to come about. So the opening words of the prayer are about God and about our desire that his purposes will ultimately be fulfilled. And we say these things before we ask anything for ourselves. When we ask for ourselves, we ask for our daily bread. And I think that includes everything that makes human life human. That is like warmth and food and shelter. It's friendships and human relationships. It's all these things that are part and parcel of our daily life. But as has often been said when people comment on the Lord's Prayer, he told us to ask for bread, not for cake. Some years ago, the Bishop of Winchester wrote a book which he called Enough is Enough. And his concern was to speak to the consumer society that Britain had become previously. The belief that we could have more and more every year, succeeding year. And he drew our attention to a Greek word in the New Testament that is translated as ruthless greed and he believed that was what was happening in our society and in the western world we were committed to a kind of ruthless greed so that we could have more and more for us and to hang with the rest and every time he said that word appears in the New Testament it is deplorable it is condemned. It is a great offence to God. The kind of ruthless greed you can see in our society. And of course we become aware of the truth of what he said through our concerns about climate change and how that relates to poverty and the third world. Give us this day our daily bread. <coughs> Give us these things that we need 
to be human like you for us and for other people. And then he says we should ask for forgiveness. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And we know how forgiveness is very difficult. If anyone has really wronged you or affected your life adversely by some kind of harm that has been done to you, you will know how difficult forgiving is. We get a sense of that when we see people on television speaking about how the abuse they received as children corrupted their adult life. They are hopeless at human relationships as adults because of the wrongs that were done to them in childhood. And you very, very seldom hear any of them saying, I forgive the perpetrator. When I was a chaplain at Craigie's prison, one day I was phoned by the prison to say there was a prisoner who wanted to see me urgently. So I went across that night to see the chaplain. And I went into his cell and I said to him, what's the issue? And the issue was that he was due in court the following day for sentencing. He had already been convicted, but he was due back the following day for sentencing. And he handed me the charge sheet that had resulted in his conviction. And he had raped a girl. He had put a comb in her back and dragged her into Seaton Park and raped her. Now we read about that in the newspapers and we shake our heads and say that's terrible. And it is. But when you actually read the chat sheet with the details of what a rape involves, it is horrifying. And he said to me, do you think I can be forgiven for this? What would you have said to him? Forgiveness is hugely difficult. And we parrot it out every Sunday without realising what I think is asked of us in asking us to forgive someone and asking us to feel forgiven for any wrongs or bad mistakes. And we know if people cannot be forgiven, that is bad for the person himself, but it's also bad for the person who cannot do the forgiving. And the third thing he says is lead us not into temptation, or do not bring us to the test, do not bring us to a test that it's too difficult for us to handle our temptation that is too big for us to resist. One of the strange things about human nature is that people continually do things that they know are bad for them and for other people. Soap operas depend on that. Soap operas depend on the fact that what Seaborn Wheel, the German theologian, called a downward pull, they, they depend on this downward pull in people for the continuing story. And you know, you sit there and say to yourself, don't do it. They're all end in tears. But you know he's going to do it. And you know it does end in tears. And this is one of the strange, perverse things about human nature. Imagine knowing that what you're going to do is going to harm you and somebody else, but you still do it. Paul talked about it. The good I do, I don't find myself doing, and the evil I want to avoid, I find myself carrying out. How can you explain that? And how can you deal with it? Well, the only way, according to our faith, is by the power of the Spirit working with us. So every prayer should end really 
with a request for God's Spirit to help us to become the people he names us to be. And the prayer that we say every Sunday, the Lord's Prayer, serves that purpose. It reminds us initially of who God is and that God is other than we are. It reminds us that our first commitment is to the kingdom of God. Remember, Jesus said, seek first the kingdom and his justice, and everything else will fall on. And then he teaches us to ask for these things which are crucially important, but difficult. And so we ask for the power of his spirit to strengthen us and enable us to be the kind of people that the Lord's Prayer can help us to become. Amen. May God bless to us this word preached in his name, and to his name the glory and the praise. What a friend we have in Jesus, all our sins and griefs to bear is him by full sin.
and we pray before you for all who have dedicated themselves to the well-being of young people in social work, health care and counselling, that they never give in to despair, but remain resilient, compassionate and strong, and value the work they do. In this holiday period, we ask your blessing on all who travel, that they may journey safely and return refreshed. May their rest enable them to cope with the daily pressures and demands of life more fully and be better equipped to continue the struggle against the forces of darkness and wrong. And we remember those who cannot afford to take time out and go on holiday that they might find space and peace and time and help to strengthen them. This prayer we ask in the name and for the sake of Jesus Christ our Lord. Lord, hear our prayer, let our cry come to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. In 270, put all your trust in God. Thank you. 